Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. And uh, we've got a great show today. We're, we're busy here in Hawaii getting through the first part of the legislative session where all the bills get seen by committees and, and we get to talk and do testimony and let the public give testimony and, and let them come out about how they feel on certain bills. And today we have uh, with us as a guest, Nicole Lohan, Representative Nicole Lohan, who is the chair of the House Environmental and in, I mean, excuse me, Energy and Environmental Protection Committee. So she's been up to her ears and um, listening to testimony at her hearings and stuff on all the energy bills. And uh, welcome to the show. Really Thank you. Glad you could make some time. I know how busy you are. It has and, been uh, busy. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you taking some time out this week. It's a busy time. When's crossover happen, by the way? Um, Another couple of weeks or? The next, the week after next on Tuesday, I yeah. believe. Okay, so it's coming up pretty quick here. Mm -hmm. And do you have a lot more bills to review um, this next, between now and then? Or are they pretty, most of them pretty much through the system? All you? the bills uh, referred to EAP that we are planning to hear have been moved out uh, already. Okay. Well, anyway, let, uh, let the audience know a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, how long you've lived here and why did you grow up here and, and what got you into um, getting into public service and working at the legislature and being an elected official? Mm -hmm. um, sure. So I'll start off, I guess I always like to joke if I had any idea what I was getting into, I never would have done this. <laughs> um, so I moved to Hawaii in 1996. Okay. My sister was living out here. I was, you know, recently out of college. I thought I'd come over here and visit and then I um, never left. I was actually born in Washington, D.C., but um, mm. my father was in the Foreign Service, so we moved away when I was one year old, and then I grew up overseas my whole um, uh, childhood until mm. we were I was 15. What part of the world did you grow up in? Uh, in Europe, okay. in different countries. So um, we actually lived in um, Paris and Brussels, but then also Belgrade, Yugoslavia, and um, East Berlin when those were... Behind the, Iron Curtain, Berlin, so. behind the Iron okay. Curtain, so okay, yeah. Wow. So we were there in the in the um, 70s, early 80s, maybe. Wow. Yeah. So you came to Hawaii and never left, huh? Came to Hawaii, never left, and never um, thought about getting involved in politics. But uh, you know, I, I represent Kailua Kona on the Big Island, and you know, lived there for many years. But eventually, I moved over to Oahu for a few years for graduate school, and studied urban planning, and then I ended up. Um, working at the legislature for Representative Jenny Kaufman, who actually okay. used to represent part of the same area that I now represent and also was chair of the Energy Committee then. Um, and then in 2012, which was a redistricting year, I um, ended up running for office. Mm -hmm. So, Did you pick up any foreign languages when you were living in Europe and growing up there? It's, they're very rusty now. Okay, yeah. I mean, I used to speak French fluently, but okay. yeah. My wife's I French would, from I French Polynesia. Some, uh, Refreshers now, yeah. I think, and then just phrases in other languages and okay. Spanish, but I learned that later. So okay, well, that's a neat background. I'm, I have my master's in international relations, which is weird because everybody else has an MBA and I have international relations. But anyway, energy stuff. What kind of bills are going through the legislature that your committees listened to this year that uh, seem to be resonating and maybe can give us some 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 uh, what they call handicapping on which ones will get through crossover and make it maybe even get voted on. Mm -hmm. And what's your impression of the general bills coming through? Do they all look pretty strong or you know, are some looking better than others? And which ones seem to be getting traction? Right. Uh, well, of course, you can never provide any guarantees. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fact. Um, <laughs> and I would be hesitant to do that. But a few that we're looking at, I think, um, include a carbon tax study. Okay. Um, so carbon tax, this is not you know, directly in the weeds of energy policy, right. I guess, but when we're talking about energy and climate and renewables mm -hmm. and um, all it's of that. It's an incentive. Or it's a, an incentive, you know, right, to, yeah. or a disincentive for fossil like fuels. Stick thing. Yeah. Um, so that's moving, and I think that's important. I mean, we probably passed too many bills for studies on the whole, but in this case, I think um, a study, which shouldn't take too long because the data is available, mm -hmm. but doing some kind of study before just um, imposing something plowing ahead something. and imposing yeah. something is important. So there's yeah. that. Um, we have um, a bill that's kind of come back year after year, which looks at um, fixing the formula that determines the RPS. Okay. Um, but I included in that, uh, we'll, we'll see if it, that part of it stays alive, but actually accelerating mm -hmm. um, the interim benchmarks for 2030 uh, and 2040. 
uh, to, to move those forward to achieve higher percent of renewables by those mm -hmm. dates. Um, we have some bills for efficiency to improve efficiency efforts and um, establish some appliance efficiency standards. Mm -hmm. uh, there's um, some bills talking about microgrids and resilience, which I think is an important piece going forward as we build this new grid to think about those things. Yeah, let's, let's, let's take off on that one a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I know Hawaiian Electric, we work a little bit with Hawaiian Electric out in my office because we have to interconnect on Hickam through NAVFAC and Hawaiian Electric, get our, all our stuff approved, interconnect agreements. And it seems like Hawaiian Electric is really kind of sold on batteries for energy storage. And we, we do, you know, hydrogen a lot for energy storage and vehicles and on the grid. But it seems like they haven't really come up with a novel design of how the future is going to look. And the resiliency piece to me means microgrids and probably islandable microgrids for communities so they can bring themselves up first before we interconnect everybody back together. Mm -hmm. um, do you kind of see that, are, are you seeing any big strategic plan by HECO to, to really look at what their grid's gonna have to change into? My impression is they kind of feel like they're, they have a grid and, and they'll have to work within what they have, not so much they have to redesign their grid and go forward. Are you getting that same impression or? Or, you know, do um, we, we have anything moving into I that? will say, I mean, I can't speak for Hawaiian Electric, but I know that they, like, when we have bills that deal with microgrids, I have seen a lot of pushback. Um, and I agree with you that, you know, we need to look at microgrids and these, you know, compartmentalizing segments of the grid. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, like, we can look at Puerto Rico and see what they're doing exactly. and, and think about the benefits of doing something similar here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'd like to work on legislation to encourage that moving forward. Um, you know, whether it's more of an upfront expense, I mean, at some point, the infrastructure piece, there's going to be some investment needed in exactly. improving it one way or the other. And, and so I think that the discussion, a lot of times I get the question, like, how are we going to achieve this, uh, mm -hmm. this RPS? Hawaii established our 100% goal now. How are we going to get there? And I think it's, the discussion should be more, how can we get there faster and do it right. in a way that's thinking about the long term and about resilience? For, you know, for example, we work a lot with the national labs as well. And eco is kind of at a saturation point, at least in certain areas, where they can't really take a whole lot more intermittent renewable like solar or wind because it's, it destabilizes their grid too much as it's structured right now. But we know to get to 100% renewable, a bunch of that's going to be intermittent renewable. And they're struggling right now at a 20, 22% point of saturation. What are they going to do when they get to 40 or 50? When the national lab studies say you get to 40 or 50, nobody's done that before. It's too destabilizing. How are you going to solve the problem? And, you know, that's where energy storage comes in. And storing energy gives you more base load, so it's not intermittent anymore. So taking that solar and wind and putting it into storage to stabilize and give you a base load at night helps them out. But we just don't see them moving that fast in that direction. And, they, and again, I agree that, that islanding and having, having isolated microgrids that can connect is, is really critical. And I kind of hope that HECO's business model shifts more towards, you know, not, not like saying we're going to fire all our linemen because we're not doing an uh, I mean a, a, a network like we have but changing their job to be more of a residential support where they're doing the same kind of work, but in a residential area instead of the big long haul high voltage lines and stuff yeah. and move, moving more in that direction. Yeah, I agree. And it seems like they're still pretty, you know, they're used to and attached to the idea of being the generator and distributor and having a lot of control which over is, everything. Which, which is, is normal. I mean, they're mm -hmm. a monopoly. Mm -hmm. That's why PUC regulates them. So the, the community has some, some control over their their activities but that's there they are they're a big monopoly and i mean what's old saying power corrupts and absolute park it's like they like having control and they want everybody else to change to meet their model because mm -hmm. that's natural it's human nature to want to you know why should i adjust why don't you adjust to me and and i think they they kind of have that they got to get over that a something bit. that might help going forward is you know the the performance based rate making docket mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. ongoing and I think, you know, when that moves forward and they come up with some way of implementing it, it will provide incentives for 
the um, utility to be rewarded for things like resilience and distributed generation and Good. Um, all of those things that we're talking about now. I That's mean, and it's understandable. I mean, they are a publicly traded company. They have stakeholders. Yeah. They're oh, responsible yeah. to. They're not going to take unnecessary risk. Exactly. And they're also mandated by law not to do that, I guess, right. also. so. Yeah, they've talked to us yeah. quite, a bit, quite a few times about um, that, like Rule 14 stuff, where they, they'd like to help out, but they're mandated. They can only do so much. So we watch that. Another thing that you kind of hit on in one of the bills was um, trying to accelerate um, not, not just the grid, but a, a, a renewable portfolio standard for vehicles. In other words, on the energy side for vehicles, mm -hmm. I know Blue Planet pushes really hard that we all, all ought to have electric vehicles by five years from now, and it's just not going to happen because the manufacturers can't even you know, do that. And a lot of what they do, and that came up in some testimony at one of your committees, was even the rental car companies are driven by customer demand. So unless everybody wants electric cars or hydrogen cars or whatever, the dealers are going to react to customer demand or rental car company customer demand mm -hmm. before they'll, ju they, they'll just take their time and move into it as the demand is there. And so, you know, I thought that the bill going through that I, I was there to testify was the getting the rental car companies and putting a kind of a, a year by year, okay, 20% here, 30% there, 50% here, 100% by 2035 or something. Mm -hmm. I thought that was actually a really good way to kind of get into it because the one reason there's probably no demand at the rental car companies right now for electric vehicles is the infrastructure is still kind of thin. And so nobody's going to yeah. want to come to a strange place they don't know in the, be in the beginning to visit and then rent a car and not know where to charge it and, and not be familiar with it. So they... The demand's not going to be there. But I think if people knew that, that they could get a good deal on an electric car and that the rental car company showed them where to charge it and stuff, that, that the demand would probably be there. And I, I think that would be a good way to kind of test bed the, uh, the customer demand side before the private sector goes full bore into uh, you know, trying to get them 25, 50, 75, 100% over the next few years. Is, is that kind of the view of, of your committee when you looked at that bill, too? Or what are some of the things you were um, thinking about? You know, we didn't get a hearing for our bill, so it might have been a Senate bill. Yeah, um, I think it was a Senate but, bill. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, of course, we have to talk about our, you know, transportation fuel issues. It's like, what, two-thirds of the oil yeah. we import yeah. um, and transition to renewables. And electric vehicles are going to be a huge part of that. Um, you know, hydrogen vehicles that we discussed earlier are another option, but I think at some point there's there's kind of like you pick a path and go that route, and it seems like electric vehicles are already pretty far ahead in the market. Um, and so that looks like the route we're taking, at least for, like, um, individual ownership. Uh, but without, the, I think charging station infrastructure is the number one thing that government can help incentivize to um, expand the amount of electric vehicles in Hawaii and move that forward. Well, I, th I thought I saw a bill going through that talked about workplace charging kind of and parking lot charging mm -hmm. um, where they were going to mandate more electric chargers by, by the state, actually by state departments and, um, and some of the private sector. Did I know I the bill that, right? that moved out of my committee was um, creating a rebate program for electric vehicle charging stations. Okay. So it was more from an incentive um, standpoint. Okay. And it was focused, the way that we passed it um, was focused on workplaces and multi-unit dwellings and commercial um, locations that, that would be open to the public or people to use in general. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we hit a midpoint of our show here. We're going to take a quick break and look at some of the other think tech shows that are on. And uh, we'll, be at, we'll be back with Representative Lowen to talk a little bit more about energy. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. 
Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Hey, aloha, and welcome back to Stan the Energy Man on my lunch hour once again. I like to always bring that up, especially when I have a state representative here keeping track of my time so I'm not on the state's uh, bill when I'm, I'm here on the show. And uh, my over, overpaid salary here at ThinkTech is zero, so we're, we're pretty clean all the way across the board. Anyway, Replo, and thanks for being on the show again. And um, we were talking a little bit about the transportation side and, um, and trying to get more incentives to get get um, infrastructure up for like electric vehicles. And you mentioned too that Noha, at Noha on the Big Island, they have a hydrogen station. Mitch Ewan from UH has got a nice hydrogen station being put there. In fact, we've got some folks working on something in parallel. You, you won't be involved in this right away, but you will be at some point with the Helion bus. Now Mitch has a bus dedicated to Helion that's hydrogen fuel cell powered already, a 25 passenger. We're looking at expanding that mm -hmm. um, as a, public-private partnership with some other folks. I'm on a committee helping them work that. And so we're looking at um, maybe doing a lot of hydrogen vehicle work on the Big Island because the distances and the hills, the mountains that the, the transportation has to traverse are more suitable to hydrogen than just pure, pure plug-in electric. So we're doing some of that. But what are some of the ways that, you know, as a lean forward, you know, looking at the future, that we can incentivize, besides carbon credits and things, how, how do you think we can help incentivize more, especially state fleet uh, purchases and state infrastructure like plug-in charging and maybe even a couple hydrogen stations? How, how do we get those things from like hydrogen stations zero to moving and on the plug-in electric charging stations from where they're at to a little bit farther down the road uh, and so the state can be kind of the leader of the way and mm -hmm. a lot more electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles in their system and their fleets. You know, what, what can the legislature do? I know funding is always an issue and appropriating funding for that is always a challenge because there's a lot, of, a lot of people all vying for the same pot of money. But what are some of the ideas that the committee has on, on trying to get there? All right. I mean, that was a lot of things That's a lot I wanted to unwrap. But um, so hydrogen on Big Island, we'll start there. Like, um, yeah, I think it's a really positive discussion, and hydrogen can be particularly useful um, somewhere that you have a lot of like excess solar during the day. It's basically like a way to store it, and it's great for like our county um, fleets. I think that's what they're talking about using um, the station they're putting down at, at Nelha, using that hydrogen for the county um, uh, mm -hmm. fleet, which. Brings up something before I move on to the second part of your question that I wanted to mention earlier when we talk about transportation is um, that the solution to this issue also can't be based on just replacing every car that's on the road sure. with an electric car or a hydrogen car. And I think we don't um, have enough discussion or push for understanding of how important public transit is right. in this equation. Um, and it's difficult too because that is <clears throat> pretty clearly a county responsibility mm -hmm. and obligation. So we have to be careful, I think, at the state legislature of, of you know, mandating things without giving additional funding, right. et cetera. But um, that is a county responsibility. And Big Island in particular is pretty far behind in terms of what they offer in public transit. Um, and I would just point out, you know, transit has multiple benefits. It's not just that we're reducing carbon. I mean, it's just it's better for um, the the way that we develop residentially. Sure. And, and I know on the Big Island, so. it's especially important because a lot of the people that work in Waikoloa and the hotels and stuff live in Hilo. And the Helion bus and that, that public transportation is not only a good idea because it keeps cars off the road, which is one big thing, but when you're commuting two and a half, three hours a day, that's wasted time when you're sitting there focused on the wheel and trying not to get in sure. a head-on collision where you could be listening to books on tape getting a master's degree, learn. I mean, yeah. the, their time is valuable too. 
So I agree that, especially on the Big Island, public transportation should be a real focus. And the county also has limited funds. They've, they've got a lot to do over there. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's why I say we're, we're actually looking to the private sector and trying to get private investors to help the county um, expand that transportation over there. So I'll fill you in more on that when it matures, but we're still at a pretty low low level entry point on that. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're right. And, and there's mode shift too. You see all the beaky bikes and other bikes that are showing up in town. Uh, I used to ride my bike in town all the time until it got stolen. And, but, I had um, bikes stolen too. Yeah, but, but the idea of, you know, <clears throat> trying to live, work, play, and the, and the building communities that are more efficient and getting mm -hmm. cars off the road, vehicle mile travel, you know, take care of that, get more cars right. off and, the road. And a lot of people do these long commutes because they can't afford to live where the jobs are, right. especially on Big Island, people commuting from Hilo or Puna or Ocean View. Right. So that being the way it is, is part of what makes me hesitant. Like when you talk about a carbon tax or a gas tax as a way to incentivize a shift to renewables, you have to also think about on the other side, the impact it has on people who can least afford it right. and, and have really no choice but to drive these long distances. Right. So no, I agree. Um, transit fact, helps solve a number of those issues and it can also yeah. help reduce the, um, the cost of housing, which is so expensive here by allowing for greater density. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have, uh, and I think it's a misperception that public transportation should be a break-even thing. For me, public transportation does always lose money, but it's taking care of the community. Right. It's got another role. No, we don't prioritize. I mean, I think part of this comes maybe from, as we talked earlier, growing up overseas. Um, this, the U.S. is very much built for cars. And, it's, yeah. and so, yeah, our, our roads aren't break-even situation right. at all. So, but somehow transit is supposed to pay for itself, yeah. even though it's more efficient and less costly if you get enough people to use it, you know, per, I guess, when you calculate that with all the various outcomes it leads to. Well, we'll, so, we'll get there. I yeah. think it, I, I wish we could <clears throat> somehow find the funding to really help the counties out in those kind of transit. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not even going to get into heart, but that's a whole different, you know, like, that scares me that that's another county thing that has kind of gotten out of control and we wouldn't even go down that road. But, um, that's public transportation. I think the way a lot of communities, including in California, there are several communities that are now canceling their, their rail programs because they're just finding out that they're way too expensive. But um, there's, there's got to be ways we can do public transportation. And yeah, and I think part of the lesson learned there is that if you, you know, build it before you desperately need it, um, and plan ahead, then it's not as costly. Yeah. You know, you could do some talk about, I mean, this is not something anyone's talking about and not something I'm proposing, but just for example, hypothetically, if you talked about doing some kind of um, train or rail or something like that on Big Island, it would be a lot easier to mm -hmm. cite it and figure out sure. like where it should go and how it should run when you're not trying to, you know, fit it in between Houses really, really and, dense yeah, urban development. Yeah, exactly, okay. Well, you were, you were going to talk about something else. I asked you a whole bunch sure, of rapid-fire questions. I think you asked how do we um, find the funding to, or how do we push forward those incentives for expanding electric vehicle and infrastructure yeah. and hydrogen. Um, so one idea, I've, or one thing I've been thinking about is, you know, we have a fair amount of revenue from the barrel tax right now, and um, some of that goes back to the general fund, and then some goes to... Um, you know, Department of Ag and Department of Health. Department of, yeah, it gets split up, and including yeah. Hawaii HNEI. State Energy Office, mm -hmm. HNEI. Um, <clears throat> and and DBED. There's not a ton of oversight for a lot of those funds on how they're used. I mean, I think they, they go to some good projects, but it's also, like, not implementing a vision. It's kind of piecemeal. It's just mm. money that's available and... Uh, That's a good point. As, as far as I think what, like, for example, what's under Department of Ag, for, for DBED, it funds the Hawaii State Energy Office, but you could make the argument that for permanent positions, we want to be doing permanent work, we should be funding them with general funds. And this source of, you know, what's basically diminishing revenue, there would be a really good nexus to look at shifting that and using it for things like electric vehicle incentives or to capitalize um, the... Um, the GEMS fund, the, mm -hmm. the low interest loans for energy efficiency and things like rooftop PV, which is mandated to be, I think, at least 50% or more for low income. Um, that I think it, there would be an interesting nexus to look at, figuring out a way to shift some of those funds and using them 
for those kind of incentives. Yeah, we, we talk with Gwen from the GEM program quite a bit, and <clears throat> I think we're, we're going to be working with her a lot, too, to try and figure out how some of the hydrogen stuff can be uh, take advantage of her program, too. Uh, and I think some of the bills and, and legislation that's getting through the system um, expands their ability to kind of expand what they can use their, their program for uh, and makes it a little bit better for putting in infrastructure for vehicles and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm really supportive of all that because I agree with you. Um, I think that the, the barrel tax money, it basically gets divided in four pieces and then the fifth piece goes back in the general fund. But once it gets divided out, there's really not a whole lot of oversight over it. And, uh, and I agree. Uh, I always think of laws as there's got to be an intent to the law. There's, there's some reason that it was written. And I think that gets lost when you do that mm -hmm. divide and spread it out. And yeah. unless it's really clear or re-emphasized or you put in a new law that says you got to do this more specifically, yeah. I think you're and right. part that goes, like, for example, there's the part that goes to Department of Ag, and it's like the food security. So it's a longer title because it's more right. than one thing, but part of it is food security special fund. And um, I think that funding gets sort of, you know, meted out in grants here and there. It's a place to find extra money to fund this program or that program. And, and generally, it's... It's a worthwhile things, but there's also like there's not an overarching vision or plan, so that it doesn't. It's not clear that it's being used in the best possible way. Okay. Well, we've got about sixty seconds left, and I'd like to just leave you with sixty seconds to talk about anything that we missed on this, or you don't have anything. I'll keep asking. <laughs> no, I mean I think uh, you know this is my first year chairing this committee, mm -hmm. and. Um, it's it's an exciting opportunity, and I still have a lot to learn. So. You still tap tap into Chris Lee once in a while to get some bounce some things off of him from time to time. Time to time. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you have any interface with the UPUC at all, or do you, you have to keep arms length from them for legal reasons? Or no, I mean we can when we have legislation we're proposing that would affect them or they're involved with, and okay. you know they're uh, they're we're always willing to have the discussion and help us work on drafts and things like that. But you know, as far as their their open dockets go and et cetera, yeah. they have, you know, they know. can't just divulge yeah. things ahead yeah. of time. So, yeah. Well, I want to thank you again for being on the show today. I told you it would be a quick 30 minutes, and I think it was pretty quick. And uh, thanks for your participation today. Thanks for serving the legislature. Like like you say, I, I'm, I'm 65 years old, and I know that I don't want to be a legislator or a politician of any kind because it's – it's a blood sport, and I have 35 years of military background, and I don't need to get into a tougher battle than I've already been in. So thanks for being there and serving and doing what you do because I know it's a lot of work and a lot of frustration, a lot of personal energy that goes into it. So thanks a lot. Thank you. And um, we'll try and get you back on sometime in the future. But for now, that's it for Stan Energy Man this Friday, and we'll see you next week. I think we've got Ben Sullivan from Kauai coming in. I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll double check. But always good talking to the neighbor islands. And we'll see you next week Friday on Stand Energy Man. Aloha.